Hey everyone, yeah, I'm Will, CEO, founder of Susa Digital. Um, great to be talking to you all and uh, working with Sean and, and Eric today. Um, going to be talking about a few different things relating to SEO and uh, certainly our experience at Suso and what we've uh, seen over the sort of past few years of, of running a, an agency which which specializes in SEO. I'm going to mention some of the changes in the SEO landscape. Um, you know, I see a lot of you guys are already working within the SEO uh, area. To, you know, be interesting at the end of the, the chat to, to see if there's any of your own observations as well. Um, we'll also talk about some of the Google, the changes in, the, in the Google's algorithm and how that's affected us as an agency, some of our strategies, how they have been uh, altered through these you know, regular updates, and then um, you know, demonstrating the value as, as a marketer as well, which um, I think we'll be, we, Sean sure will be talking about. So just to give you a brief overview of, uh, of, my, of my company. So five years ago, we actually decided to pivot away from being a full stack marketing agency and to focus on purely being uh, an SEO only specialist. So we were providing services within PPC, you know, AdWords, uh, we, we do Facebook advertising, um, content marketing, and then we also had SEO. And, what we soon came to notice as a startup agency was that a lot of these channels were, were becoming more and more sophisticated. You know, five years ago, what worked in PPC isn't necessarily what works today. Five works five years ago, what was working in, ad, in, in Facebook ads isn't necessarily, you know, working as effectively now. And the same with content marketing, you know, content marketing, there's lots of innovative kinds of strategies, uh, which, you know, have, have evolved over the years. And, for us, we decided that, you know, as the digital landscape became more and more sophisticated, SEO was going to be our specialism. Um, so, yeah, Sean, if you want to just move on to the next slide. So in terms of, you know, the, uh, the, the how the SEO landscape has changed and one of the reasons that we decided to specialize is because of this increased sophistication and the, the frequency of the Google algorithm updates. You know, it's notorious within the SEO industry just how regular the algorithm updates occur. You know, we're, we're working with one of the most, if not the most sophisticated algorithm ever built. So therefore, as SEOs, it's very important for us to try and be as up to date as possible with regards to the way the algorithm is changing and, and to be. Uh, and this is one of the reasons that we decided to specialize in order to keep up to date with this, you know, the, with the complexities. We put all of our resources into becoming this particular specialist in in the area of, of, of what we define more as a, a technical area of marketing. Um, so in terms of how SEO has changed and you know, just to give some more sort of um, overview information around that, there's around 200 factors that, that, that are involved in ranking websites. We obviously, you know, as SEOs, we, we, we work with some of those factors directly, links, um, you know, the, 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 the content marketing, but there's actually within each, each of those components of SEO, there's there's many, many factors, and overall, they, you know, they're, they're, it's it's uh, reported that there's around 200 factors that are involved in ranking a website. Um, each year, Google is making up to 500 to 600 you know, tweaks to the algorithm just to change, you know, certain things to understand how users are um, are, are, are uh, interacting with the search engine results. And there are, over, there are three core algorithm updates and two product review updates in 2021 um, only. So this, again, just gives us an uh, indication of, 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 of you know, how difficult it is an area of marketing when there are so many algorithm updates. And again, one of the reasons, one of the main reasons that we specialize in an agency was to be able to keep up with this. And we've all seen this um, you know, iceberg um, reference. And I think it's particularly um, uh, relevant to SEO in the, what the 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 the, uh, the components would go into ranking in a first position it, it may look quite simple you know uh, it's certainly you know putting money into adwords let's say and then getting first page ranking on adwords it's there's a lot of sophistication that goes into that same with seo to get to the first page position there's a ton of things that need to be going on in the background um you know your backlink strategy your content strategy site speed crawlability 
uh, mobile indexing. There's a lot of stuff that goes on in the background within an SEO campaign, uh, and it's multi faceted it's a very sort of complex area of marketing with lots of different components that need to be juggled in order to to to, to get those uh those rankings and yeah just to give a further um sort of highlight of, of, of those algorithm updates over over time so since 2011 there's been a huge number of you know core algorithm updates most people are familiar with the early sort of bigger algorithm updates with names like Panda, Penguin, Panda affecting on-site SEO, Penguin being more links focused. And then since then, there are regular algorithm updates. It's, I think the days of SEOs being sort of shocked when an algorithm update happens and worrying and losing sleep over the algorithm updates kind of doesn't really occur anymore because we're so used to them that they are so regular. And I think really as SEOs, it's, it's in our interest for there are regular algorithm updates because ultimately the search engine results are becoming more quality. Um, you know, lower quality SEO is getting phased out. And I think as you know, high quality sort of SEO service providers, it's 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 a good thing for us in order to be able to, you know, be more um more happy that the search engine results are actually giving better kinds of um websites that the, the higher high engine search engine results. There's been a number of updates over time relating to mobile updates. Um, Core Web Vitals is a, is a more recent update that's occurred, which relates to user experience, speed, mobile first indexing. And you know, this is a you know, just a snapshot of, of, of the major core algorithm updates, and this this will continue to occur. And again, is one of the reasons why as SEOs we need to be particularly uh, on top of these kinds of changes because you know what was working in 2011 isn't necessarily working you know now and what was working five years ago when we decided to to pivot away from being a full stack marketing agency isn't necessarily what's working now so i think in order to sort of really think about the way seo is going and you know where we thought about seo when we decided to focus on this one channel is to look at google's mission statement and it's google's mission statement is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful and that's why search makes it easy to discover a broad range of information from a wide variety of sources i think it's important to think about that because it really once we start to get under the bonnet of what google is actually trying to achieve with the algorithm it starts to allow us to think more uh you know in a way that search engine results should actually should be presenting the results that google wants users to be seeing not necessarily what seos want to be seen and i think we need to always be thinking about this kind of mission statement because it allows us to think about you know basically giving google what what it wants to, to achieve so in terms of you know the way SEO changed in terms of sophistication as SEO is how we've been how we need to think about it is Google's ability to determine the rankability of web page um, things about users search querying is continually growing in complexity so there's elements of SEO now relating to machine learning neural networks artificial intelligence and this is only going to continue to grow within the SEO industry there's there's you know artificial intelligence AI the way that Google um, presents search engine results, it's all going to, you know, there's going to be a lot more uh, impact from, from these very, uh, you know, sophisticated elements of the algorithm. So thinking about SEO in terms of on these more complex kind of level is the way we need to be thinking about it. So SEOs nowadays should really think more like Google developers rather than like SEOs. And what we mean by that is, by thinking about the way Google developers are thinking about evolving the algorithm, it allows us to think, you know, where is the algorithm going and preempt some of these changes? What kind of, you know, we've seen the, the changes from over 10 years moving from sort of a penguin algorithm update right up to now where we have the core uh, web vitals algorithm update. Thinking more along the lines of the way Google developers are thinking and, you know, less like SEOs allows us to think, you know essentially where is the algorithm going and and this is what we at SUSE are trying to 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 build is an ethos is you know let's think more like google developers than like a than, than like seos and so i'm going to list some of the changes that have occurred over the last few years in terms of seo um 
and compared those you know to, to when we actually pivoted away from a full stack marketing company into a specialist and so technical seo technical seo five years ago was not as important as it is today so prior to you know the some of the more recent algorithm updates really links and content could get you quite a long way without particularly good technical foundations now technical seo from our perspective is the foundation of seo if you don't have a website that can be crawled effectively if if the the pages can't be found if the if the platform that, that a site is being built on isn't particularly seo friendly then that has already starts to get more of a red flag against the website so even with high quality links and high quality content uh SEO isn't necessarily working particularly well nowadays in terms of you know the, the importance of technical SEO. And back thought five years ago, you know the, the site maps, robots.txt, metadata were some of the more basic kind of things that, that could be done with technical SEO. Whereas nowadays, and these are all things that would have worked five years ago, but the importance is being placed more upon them. Things like site speed performance, index management structured data, mobile SEO, making sure that JavaScript, which a lot of websites are being built in, is being rendered properly for, for SEO. All of these things are very, very important for, for actually sound SEO. And whenever we start running SEO campaigns, the first thing that we look at is the technical SEO, because as we move you know, client sites through the, the different months of different strategies involving the content, involving the links, we make sure that you know the, the technical SEO is sound because without it, those links and those content strategies won't be as effective. And so one thing that we've seen is that programmers make great SEOs. Now, traditionally, we've seen that programmers typically go into tech, they'll move into you know coding, they'll go straight into, um, into SaaS. Whereas we've started to see a trend now where programs are actually starting to see that there's an opportunity to become marketers and I think SEO offers them that and this is something that as uh, at SUSE we we have we bring a lot of programmers into the company and actually train them up in SEO because essentially we're thinking about it more from a from an algorithmic perspective a technical perspective this is a very technical area of marketing and so SEOs that have that background in in programming tend to be very very strong when it comes to actually preempting where the algorithm is going and and building the the foundations you know in terms of those technical strategies content so obviously content is you know one of the most important things within seo obviously content marketing is often equated with with seo um, there are subtle differences in terms of what you can achieve with a content marketing strategy. There's obviously brand building content marketing strategies, and then there's more sort of algorithmic focused SEO content marketing strategies. Now, you know, back sort of five years ago, more content typically meant better SEO. You know, there was sort of opportunities to keyword stuff, even without sort of spammy keyword stuffing. Sort of lots of references, even naturally within the uh, within long form content, adding keywords would be the typical kind of strategy that SEOs would use. You know, there'd be blog posts which would want to rank for a particular keyword, which then may link into a product page. This was typically a strategy which would be more effective. Nowadays, content is typically um, in terms of the search results driven by searcher intent. Search, and so there are AI techniques within the within within SEO, uh, you know, such as the BERT algorithm, natural language processing, but has allowed Google to be better at actually understanding what the content is about and understanding how that content equates with the user intent. So, as SEOs, we need to make sure that we're serving content that the user is looking for. And so, there's a lot of things that need to be considered when it comes to that content strategy from an algorithmic point of view in comparison to you know five years ago. So Google wants to provide users with the best possible answer to their search query. And so this is why when we're creating content, but this needs to reflect the searcher's uh, user intent. And what we mean by that is there's different forms of content. And so it may be that a searcher is, is, is making a query where it's more sort of they're looking for more informational kind of pieces, i.e. what are the benefits of turmeric? And so 
when thinking about certain kinds of uh, content to serve up for certain types of keywords, we need to make sure that that content is reflected of, uh, of what the, uh, the searcher is using for. There's no point in trying to optimize a page which is very buyer specific, you know, selling different types of turmeric, if the web, uh, if the query isn't necessarily uh, in line with that particular um, searcher intent. So, you know, when thinking about content strategy, it's good to, to actually put the different types of content into different types of um, forms. And so informational is one particular form. Navigational, so there may be certain search queries which are essentially being very specific on the kind of page that is being looked for. And so, you know, again, thinking about content, which is literally just, you know, presenting the page, which is, uh, which, which, which a user is looking for. Commercial investigation, a searcher might be in the market for a spe specific product, such as best headphones. Normally that means that the site needs to have some kind of informational element, but less buyer intent. You know, it's definitely a, a period within the buying cycle, which is more um, investor, more of an investigation rather than, you know, direct to sale. And transactional. So this is typically where e-commerce pages, which are purely product pages, can be optimized for these kinds of keywords uh, when a user is ready to buy, such as buy a MacBook Pro. Now, keyword cannibalization is a uh, is, is 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 something that we see a lot of as SEOs, and it, you know, in terms of a content strategy, is something which needs to be thought of. Certainly, big change over the last sort of five years that we see more regularly is that Google is starting to penalize sites for keyword cannibalization, and this is typically where you have multiple pages which are competing for the same keyword. Now, Google wants to have diverse search results; it doesn't want to have lots of the same website ranking for the search same keyword and if you look at this graph on the right which is taken from um, ahrefs that graph with the different colors is essentially showing different pages which are ranking for the search term searcher uh, sherpa crm now what it shows is that essentially this website is confusing google with which page needs to rank for the for, for that particular keyword there's lots of different pages which are bouncing in and out of the index for that particular search term. And as you can see, Google isn't ranking more than one page at a time. So when creating content strategies, it's very important to make sure that there's a structure and that there's certain pages which are, which are dedicated to particular keywords which are uh, important in terms of the landing page. So content writers should be thinking, should be creative, but they should think algorithmically as well. Content writing within SEO isn't necessarily just a creative endeavor. Having knowledge of, you know, the algorithm and understanding some of the, you know, you, these user intent signals and understanding, um, you know, the way Google's algorithm is, 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 is evolving is very important. And it's, this is something, again, that at SUSE, we, we build into our training of our SEOs is even though, you know, we have a lot of programmers that, have, that are SEOs in the company, even our creatives think on an algorithmic basis as well. So there's a lot of training that we provide, technical training to more creative thinkers. So this is what we try and hit with that balance of both the creative and also the technical. Link building, obviously this is a very um, uh, interesting topic within SEO, uh, you know, back sort of, five years ago certainly 10 years ago pre penguin it was very easy to beat the algorithm with links um you know you could have backlinks with targeted anchors and with with keyword rich anchor text and that would obviously lead to to a lot of seo success normally short-lived uh, success but it would certainly you know work often it was based around the numbers of links rather than the quality of the links now even sort of five years ago google was getting much better at cracking down on that kind of link building um, but now it's even better at it as well. So Google is be better than ever at actually identifying link manipulation. Um, even when it comes to outreach, outreach, which traditionally is, you know, a, a white hat form of, of, of link building. Google is also now starting to spot more manipulative kinds of um, outreach link building. So this is why it's very important when you are 
getting links via outreach to make sure that there are particular um, uh, footprints that aren't present within the website. They're not necessarily advertising themselves as having um, uh, links being sold. You know, they don't have queues such as right for us. There needs to be some traffic to the pages. Whenever we do link building, we make sure that the, the websites that we're getting links do look as uh, do look natural, that there's no strange injections of links, no strange manipulation of the metrics. Uh, we make sure that there's anchor text distribution on the website, which is nice and uh, natural. And of course, the relevance of the, of the websites is more important than ever. Previously, it would have been um, you know, okay to get links from non-relevant sites to, uh, to, 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 let's say, you know, uh, an insurance website linking to a, a pet shop. Uh, if the website was, 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 had good metrics, it would give you an SEO boost. Nowadays, the, uh, the boost that you get from that isn't necessarily as strong as it used to be. So having that relevancy from the links for, from the websites that you get is very, very important. Keyword research, this is, you know, uh, sort of the bedrock of SEO, you know, making sure that any keywords that are important to your business are being uh, targeted. So typically, you know, in the past, SEOs would try and find the keyword with the highest amount of traffic, try and add long form content with a few simple keyword variations and, and basically build, a, build links to it and, and, and hope for the best. Now, you know, there's a lot more data with regards to keywords. Keywords are, you know, there's, there's new trending keywords all the time. And there's a lot of topical keyword research that can be done. So there's lots of layers and recursive kinds of keyword research that can happen, which off the back of certain types of uh, high traffic keywords can start to lead to more longer tail versions of, of, of high buyer intent kinds of keywords. There's multiple semantic variations of keywords. And there's ways that you can actually start to build in a uh, keyword strategy targeting all these various types of different keywords with, with, with what we call content clusters. And so when we're building um, the, the, a keyword strategy, what we think about is, is, is the content that supports all these keywords. So we'll typically have a pillar page, which will be the main, um, uh, the, the main, uh, keywords that we, that we would be looking to rank for. And then we would have long tail variations of those keywords on um, other content linking into the main pillar content. So the cluster content linking to the pillar content to help support that main pillar content. And this is one of the strategies that you, we use at SUSO to make sure we're really exhausting all of the different topical relevance towards a keyword, but making sure that each page that we're trying to rank has its own dedicated um, page which isn't necessarily you know uh trying to to to, to OB over optimize for the algorithm but just making sure that the information that's been provided is very structured so that there's no issues with keyword cannibalization and so give the example here of, of sweatshirts you may be that the, the main pillar page is related to the the search term men's sweatshirts and then the cluster content around that is various different long tail versions of, of the sweatshirt. I've used um, jumpers there. I'm not sure if that's a, a US term or not. So we will we, we'll say sweatshirts um, where there's different types of sweatshirts, which would ultimately link into the main pillar page. Now with content hubs, the benefits are them is that you can work for more keywords. It, bring, it can build brand awareness. Uh, you know, these content hubs may be some form of a guide yeah allows you to, to 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 think of interesting blog ideas which have an seo focus uh, it can improve your crawlability and indexability the more pages that google find and 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 um, can, can reference in terms of the keywords that are associated with it the more uh, authority the page will get and the more uh, keywords that it's likely to rank for and to build topical for topical authority you may have heard of uh, terminology such as EAT, expertise, authority, and trust. This allows you to build that kind of authority to become uh, established um, niche dominance. Competitor analysis, comparing you know what it was like you know when we started sort of five years ago before pivoting to, to now. Simple reverse engineering would be as far as really you could go with regards to competitor analysis. Uh, you'd look at 
a backlink checking tool such as ahrefs essentially look at the quantity of, of links which was you know the most important thing and you'd look at how many links you then need to be able to outrank the competitor competition that would be typically a uh, you know a reverse engineering kind of strategy when it comes to competitor analysis now it's a lot more complex um, you know there's there's a number of tools that you can use to reverse engineer you know you don't just have tools which look at the the backlink uh, backlinking strategy there's now a number of tools you can use, actually use to reverse engineer content strategy you can see the word count being used the, the amount of time semantic keyword placements are being used on competitor sites the on-page keyword diversity, uh, the heading structure. Uh, and then when it comes to, 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 to links, there's a lot more data around with regards to not just seeing the quantity of links, but the type of links, what the relevance of those links are to the competitor, where they're getting those links from, uh, the, the, the DA of those links, or DR if you use Ahrefs. Uh, and there's a lot of ways nowadays that we can actually reverse engineer that goes beyond just looking at the number of backlinks. And so, yeah, just to give an indication of those, Ahrefs, which is our tool of choice, we can now see all of these metrics regarding the, 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 the competition links. We can look at the DR, which is domain rating, the number of backlinks going to those links, the number of domains going to those links, the amount of traffic, uh, and a particular metric that we always look at when we're looking at backlink strategies, the, the keywords which are actually ranking for uh, on the domain that we're getting the link from. So if the keywords which are ranking, for the domain, uh, the keywords of the domain where we're getting the link from uh, are relevant to our client's website. Typically, that's a good sign that it's a, a site which will give a lot of topical relevance. Um, there's a lot of uh, additional information once you dig into a software like Ahrefs, starting to give more information on um, the amount of uh, competition relating to certain keywords, the amount of um, uh, competing domains. We also use a tool called Surfer SEO, which is um, very, very good in terms of content analysis. It allows us to start seeing some of the semantic authority, some of the word counts, which our uh, competitors are, are, are using, some of the content strategies. And just to give an indication here of just how deep now com competition analysis actually goes in comparison to maybe five years ago, which is you know before we pivoted. Performance and usability, this is another area of SEO which is particularly um, important nowadays, certainly since the Core Web Vitals updates recently. Typically, you know, historically, the, the, the best methods of, of measuring performance would be things like bounce rate, average time spent on the page. Site speed was important. You know, I'm not saying these things weren't important, but they're more important than ever now. Uh, Core cool Web Vitals is now, you know, inbuilt into the algorithm. You can use Google Dev Tools to actually check out the performance from a web Core cool Web Vitals uh, perspective. And conversion rate optimization as well is also um, indirectly related to SEO. If you're getting a site which is converting well and it's all being tracked in Google Analytics, that ultimately is going to give you more uh, credibility within Google. And so with regards to the page experience, um, you know, Core Web Vitals typically looks at loading speed, interactivity, the visual stability of a website. And then you have all the different uh, elements such as Google friendliness, uh, sorry, mobile friendliness, safe browsing using HTTPS protocol, uh, more se secure protocol. Um, and these are all giving search signals for, for page ex experience. So having these kinds of um, high quality uh, page experience elements will help with your SEO. It's our uh, an essential part of an SEO strategy, certainly more essential than it was, say, five years ago. So just to summarize, in terms of what today SEO requires, having sort of specialist SEOs, in, in my opinion, is, is essential. Um, having that kind of broad range of digital marketing skills is, is obviously, you know, very, very important, but actually having, you know, specialists within SEO with the amount of uh, sort of sophistication and complexity, certainly on the technical side of things, is, is very important for being able to actually deliver KPI-driven strategies. Um, link building nowadays is more sophisticated than ever, actually having creative link building strategies to get links from high quality websites. Having that deep technical knowledge and understanding of things like AI, machine learning, methodology, you know, from, from our perspective is also very important and why we believe that you know, programmers actually make really good quality SEOs. 
And then I think that semantic approach to writing content as well, not just writing content for one particular keyword, thinking about all the different variations of the keyword and, and relevant uh, and trending keywords that could also be uh, related to, to, to the content strategy. Sean, if you want to go through. Cool. So with, with uh, sort of, sorry, yeah, there was. So yeah, with regards to you know just a bit of information about SUSO, so we're actually a our specialism is in outsource SEO. We work with a lot of agencies uh, that have an appetite to be able to offer more kinds of complex kinds of SEO strategies. Maybe agencies that don't offer SEO but feel there is uh, an opportunity to to be able to outsource and, and be able to bolster the services. And what we've seen in terms of you know why we found that this positioning is particularly interesting and you know in terms of the market demand is nowadays it is very expensive to hire uk and us talent you know certainly in the uk the average seo nowadays is about sixty thousand pounds um they're very difficult to find it's so, especially if you're a, you know a growing um challenger agency startup agency you can also attract that talent is, is is very difficult finding technical seos in particular is is extremely difficult certainly within the uk you tend to find you know a lot of seos will have gone uh, to some of the bigger agencies technical seos are at the moment the most hot in, in high demand kind of seo retaining that talent is difficult as well there's a lot of big companies buying up seo talents there's a lot of uh, you know seos that are actually going in house rather than sticking with agency uh, and there's obviously, you know, administrative and, and logistical complexities when it comes to, you know, growing your own SEO team. Now, we found and, you know, actually from experience, you know, I used to outsource elements of, 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 of our service. You know, we are in-house now, but we're only in-house with SEO. And, you know, this is where we've specialized. So there's a number of benefits to outsourcing. Essentially, you can focus on what you're best at. Um, you know, whether that's sales, whether that's um, client management, whether that's being really great at PPC, but being wanting to, to do SEO, it allows you to focus on what you're um, strongest at in terms of delivering really top quality service to the client. You can remove anxiety over uh, for over and under hiring. You know, a lot of agencies I know struggle where they may lose a couple of contracts and they've over hired and it's difficult to be able to, you know, bring the new sales on to be able to cover overheads. Also, you know, under hiring and having those sales opportunities, which are there in front of you, but not being able to actually, you know, do the service for another two or three months because you're waiting to hire. This is, you know, obviously some of the issues as agency owners that we have. Um, you know, you control your profitability with outsourcing as well. You know, it's it's all very sort of clear in terms of what the cost of the service is. You apply your margin on top of whatever the, the cost is so that, you know, there is more control over there. You can scale your sales. So sales, uh, you know, getting new clients on board isn't necessarily, you know, something you need to, to be concerned about with regards to being able to deliver. Sales can, as the sales come in, you're able to actually uh, perform the service. By having a ready-made team of specialists, you can just tap straight into an infrastructure that's already built as well. Um, so that's my two cents on sort of outsourcing SEO versus uh, in-house SEO. Um, and yeah, I think uh, from there, Sean. Um, Perfect. Great. Yeah, thank you very much. That was fantastic. I definitely learned a lot about uh, uh, how SEO has evolved over the years, definitely since we as a, a company were a marketing agency. Um, regardless of what the marketing strategies you're using, whether it's uh, uh, SEO paid or uh, uh, getting somebody in a uh, gorilla suit to run around on the street, whatever, at the end of the day, uh, I think it's quite easy as a marketer uh, to deliver some value to uh, to your clients. And uh, the exceptional pay setters definitely deliver way more value than uh, the people that are just using a checkbox. Yes, I do that. But really what I want to talk about here is uh, demonstrating value delivered versus uh, actually the delivering of value as a marketer. So I think the way most, uh, most agencies, uh, most marketers, even if it's in-house or uh, it's a case that uh, uh, you are working for an agency, uh, we all have to communicate to some constituent uh, uh, what we're doing for that constituent. 
right? As an agency, that mechanism typically is, we're doing some type of a reporting or some type of reporting, right? And uh, the, the, the question is, is one, is why are we reporting? I think it, for me, it's obvious, but maybe, maybe it may not be. Uh, the reality is people are coming to you as a marketer um, because really they're looking to unlock some untapped business potential that they believe exists, right? So they have a business, it's growing at some rate, and they, the reality is there's a, they believe that there's a lot of people that have a need for their product or service that they're not reaching, right? So what they will do is they will engage with uh, either they'll hire in-house, but uh, I think the strategy, uh, the more common strategy now is to outsource this to experts, in other words, to a marketing agency. And a client would be paying you as an agency or a marketer because they believe that you have expertise in tools, uh, ever-shifting buyer trends, even the whole environment of digital commerce, right? Is they're experts at building stuff and things. They are not experts in, uh, in these types of things that are related to uh, uh, demand generation. So the reality is if all of this is true and they have hired the right person, the, the right team, the right, uh, the right agency, my question is why would you need to report? Right? Why would you need to report to a client as to like, why would you be doing your monthly reports to clients? Right? Because if you're the expert and you're absolutely the money well spent, the reality is uh, arguably you wouldn't need to report. They would just know. A previous company I was in, uh, we, uh, we were selling industrial, uh, industrial software and our company had what was called the gold club. Right, and the gold club or gold it was sort of a give, it was a, an award given to one person in the company that has made the biggest impact on the business over the past year. I can say with certainty that was never given to a, a marketer, right? <laughs> Why? It's typically given to a salesperson because at the end of the day, it's uh, very easy to identify that yes. Uh, you know, as a, for example, a business that says, you know what, I, I lack these, this, this expertise in uh, uh, digital marketing, so I'm going to go find this, this expert. So you've signed the contract, you're doing work, but let me tell you, it, the real difficulty is, is keeping that, uh, the attention of the client and um, building the trust that they will, they have spent their money in, in the right place with the right team and will continue spending it. So typically the mechanism for this is through reporting, right? So we have some type of uh, reporting that allows us as marketers to communicate to our constituents the impact we are having and that the money truly is well spent. Now, uh, if we ask agencies today, and I look at back when we were an agency as well, is that, uh, uh, you know, how often are we reporting? And we ask that question at the beginning. And common, it's typically around once a month, right? I would say that uh, uh, never reporting might be a bit of a challenge because it's a case that, uh, 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 you know, uh, you know, you're putting a lot of trust, they're putting a lot of trust in you. And if you're not communicating them, I would argue with the client and argue, argue, even if it's an internal constituent, uh, definitely we have to go through this process of, uh, of, of reporting. So, but typically it's once a month. And if we think about how long it takes as a company to, uh, as an agency to uh, get these reports ready for the, one, for the client meeting, quite often it's only three to five hours, right? But as you, you know, multiply that by the number of clients you have, it starts being a fairly hefty expense. And quite often what we've seen, even ourselves when we were an agency, a lot of that labor was involved in copy and pasting things. And quite often we would delegate this to some junior associate that actually couldn't interpret or make a commentary on uh, what is what the stats and uh, things that they're copy and pasting actually means. And then somebody has to go into this meeting and uh, handle questions and really defend why the, the client should continue paying you to do the work. 
Now, if we uh, look at how m most agencies report, it's quite often it's a slide deck, and maybe you know if the if they're lucky, there is a slide deck involved. So they go through a presentation. There's definitely some type of a PDF. You know, there's this thud factor. My client is paying me ten grand a month. That report better make a very big sound when I drop it onto their desk. And there's definitely a uh, some type of a discussion. And the question that I asked at the beginning of this uh, presentation was, you know, how many metrics are in that report. And uh, if I was surveying agencies ourselves at the time, when we were an agency, you know, it was definitely more than 20 that we would report on uh, once a month. But typically the average are somewhere in there between 15 and 20 metrics that are related to the work that we're actually doing uh, as, as marketers. And there's you know, lots of stats, right? It's a case that we're talking about things like, you know, click-through rate, CPC, you know, branded versus non-branded, all of this stuff that is arguably extremely important. But think about this for a second. Imagine, you know, if I went to my mom today and started talking about the, you know, taking my client report and actually delivering it to my mom uh, uh, and talking about these stats, click-through rate, CPC, bounce rate, her eyes would just gloss over. She would think, what, an, uh, what, a, what a smart young man. He sure knows a lot about this stuff, right? Uh, but arguably, it means absolutely nothing to her. And I argue a lot of this stuff that we definitely as experts spend a lot of our time losing sleep over, it really means nothing to the client. You know, you may, you know, you, you can argue with me on this, but uh, definitely a business owner, what they're losing sleep over is that untapped business potential and connecting the dots between these types of stats and the untapped business potential that they're hiring you to un unlock, it's a long stretch, right, to, to make the connection. So I'm sure all of us, when we're reporting with clients, would produce something like this, right? You know, there's ad groups, so if we're in, in paid advertisement or in, if it we're talking about SEO or, you know, talking about keyword ranking, keyword, all the stuff that uh, will definitely uh, present it fantastically on. But again, my, my topic here is about communicating the results to the clients, right? So this type of a table, I'm sure has showed up in uh, any, any one of, uh, any one of your, uh, your reports to your clients. Now, and quite often the reporting is, is based on uh, anonymous uh, aggregate data, right? There's <clears throat> stats there, it's, it's numbers of anonymous people, right? It is numbers, it truly is numbers as opposed to people. Right, and if we think about again back to why we're reporting, it's to again it's our opportunity to communicate to clients that their money is well spent. Right. So the question is, is you know clearly I'm going somewhere with this. Uh, how should we be reporting? Right. Well, if we go back to uh, this diagram, this I should say this table here. Compare this to this. Now there's still stats, but the stat I'm showing you here is revenue, right? So if you look at this, this table here, this is talking about revenue attribution for the last, first site. In other words, the first touch over the past 30 days of the money that we've actually pulled in as a business uh, is attributed to these specific digital marketing efforts. You say, for example, organic search is brought in half a million dollars in the past 30 days. It definitely justifies your budget for spending on SEO, right? Same thing for, you know, look here, for paid advertisement. Again, if you can say definitively that $372,000 of uh, the client's revenue uh, started with the click of an ad all the way through to a purchase, that's definitely a stronger story than just talking about uh, stats that we know. All businesses, they are absolutely concerned about uh, uh, top line and profitability, right? So we need to bring these stories into our discussions when we're communicating with, the, back to my story about the gold club. The reason the salespeople are always in the gold club is because it's very easy for them to communicate the impact, the revenue that they've delivered to the, to, to the business.
We need to do that as marketers, I argue. Now, it's really end of the day, no matter what we're communicating with our clients, we need to demonstrate the value we are uh, delivering to our clients. We need to report on metrics that the clients understand and they lose sleep over. Right? What are the metrics that they anticipate or are uh, definitely uh, need to you know, focus on as a business? Not the ones that you need to focus on. What do they need to focus on? And how does what you're doing relate to those specific met metrics? So I argue you have to talk about revenue, right? You have to bring revenue into the story. And uh, I argue that it is very difficult to relate revenue just talking about stats, right? So if we're just relying on things like Google Analytics to fill our reports with stats, we are actually eroding trust with our clients rather than building trust. So if I go back to this story here, just summarizing that table, you know, this ad group for, you know, targeting these specific, uh, these specific ad groups created 38 conversions, uh, two conversions for vehicle access, branded uh, uh, ad group with 77 conversions and uh, focusing on our stealing our competitors business uh, related to 14 conversions. Now, if I reported this to a client, it makes me, you know, one, as I can argue, it's making me look like a hero. But now my client goes to the sales department and says, gee, you know, my marketing, my, the marketers I'm paying a ton of money for, they've generated well over 175, uh, whatever the number is, uh, uh, conversions over the past month. Why was there only two sales? Right. And then the whole dialogue starts. Yeah, well, the leads are producing a crap and blah, blah, blah. They're, you know, the, the trust is is definitely they're going to trust these people that are in the gold club more than they're going to be trusting you. Because let's face it, you are not. These stats are one anonymous two. they're not real. The reality is, if you were able to produce two good sales for this client, your whole fees for the month are, are, are justified. So, but instead of you're you're actually uh, communicating stats as opposed to real buyer stories. So, if we think about what we're all facing as marketers, we generate leads. The thing the view into this uh, this this process is things like Google Ad, AdWords, Google Analytics, uh, etc. And they deliver stats. We throw the lead over the fence, and then the salespeople take it, and the and the business is typically recognized in the CRMs where we have no visibility to it. So again, uh, back to how should we report, and how much, uh, what should be giving our clients? We need to think about what is the one, what is the one KPI that our clients uh, anticipate the number daily. In other words, they slept all night losing sleep over something, right? What is that number that they would be happy, excited, actionable uh, to look at when they get up in the morning, right? So I was on a call uh, yesterday, actually, it was with a company and their VP sales, he looks at calls per salesperson every hour. Right, this is so important to him that he looks at it hourly. Other companies, it's like how many appointments were actually attended yesterday, you know. And for software companies, definitely a stat that every software company is interested in is how many trials were signed up for that nobody called. Right, it's finding what is the one stat that the the, the client loses sleep over on a daily basis, and. If you deliver that stat with your brand on it every single day, they're looking at your brand every day and relying on that stat. Now, uh, really, the, the point of the story here is that make sure that every single goal or that's scored by your team can be measured and branded and delivered with actionable information to your clients. So again, the very important thing is branding the wins. I think that's a, a great, a, a great, a great store, uh, strategy. So compare that table that I showed you a few slides ago to some a story like this, right? Is that Jennifer Smith, who's working for, she's the CMO of this specific company. She clicked a Google ad on our Spring 22 promo, and she came to a, a, a trends page. 
uh, was interested, uh, filled out the request to quote, and there was a deal uh, opportunity created in the CRM, right? And for the agency, I'd like to imagine this for, your, for, your, for yourself, is that uh, uh, let's say the deal was worth $76,000. Now, if you're reporting this user story to, as a marketer to your client, for example, number one, it's irref irrefutable, right? There is nobody that will be able to say, no, Jennifer didn't buy this. And no, Jennifer did not click, you know, uh, it's, it's, they it, can't say it's a crap lead because it actually produced true results. So the point of the story here is if you're talking about real user journeys in your reporting, the reporting doesn't have to be that complex, right? It's really talking about relating your effort to the actual people who are purchasing from, uh, from your clients. So really the summary here is that marketing agencies, you need to demonstrate the value you're delivering. I think that's, a, that's, that's really the story. Now, how do you do it? right? Well, our company has released a product called Agency Reporter that connects to many of the CRMs on the market today. So not only does it combine uh, website traffic, traffic uh, tracking with uh, full buyer journeys from first touch on the website, all the way through to the lead being produced and sent to the client, all the way through to that exact person buying on uh, buying uh, 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 with a closed deal in the CRM. So with the agency reporter package, it's fast to actually deploy. It allows you to produce very simple, uh, meaningful dashboards and stream KPIs into your client's inbox as the bodies uh, of an email as opposed to a PDF. So really it's about finding a way to connect the work you're doing to the revenue uh, uh, of relating these two things and putting your branding on the win. So really the, the point of the story here is yes, we're doing all of our work, uh, whether it's SEO, paid advertisement, whatever it is, we're being paid to drive or again, unlock this untapped, uh, uh, untapped business potential. With Agency Reporter, it connects to all of the data sources, and more importantly, to the CRM that allow us to communicate with our agency's brand uh, the value we're delivering to our clients. So that's it.